Okay, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome once again, and thank you for being here <coughs> tonight at our monthly series, uh, Librarian's Wall. It's a monthly session where our librarians uh, do their sharing, uh, their experience, and give their insights and thoughts on the area of their expertise. So the horror genre has a special place in Singapore's book publishing and movie history as seen through uh, iconic publications and productions such as the almost complete collection of true Singapore storybooks and Pontianak films. So tonight, Associate Librarian Jacqueline Lee will talk about this genre of publication and its evolution while reflecting on the wider culture of horror in Singapore. And Jacqueline is an associate librarian with the National Library working with the Legal Deposit and uh, Web Archive Collection. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jacqueline Lee. Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, thank you for coming for this talk. Uh, I'm really excited to share what the National Library has in our collections on Singapore horror. And judging from the turnout tonight, it's also quite a popular topic. Yeah, so let's get started. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'll share a bit about what I do at the National Library and also a bit about myself. After that, I will share an NLB survey on reading habits to find out who reads Singapore horror. As, after that, we'll delve right into the horror fiction history of Singapore as well as the horror films history. And then we'll, I'll share some NLB resources that you can also access if you would like to find out more. So since we're talking about our Singapore collections today, I'll just share very quickly my role at the National Library because it actually focuses on uh, getting more materials into our collections. Yeah, first, uh, what I do is legal deposit. Legal deposit is a statutory function of the National Library where it's mandated that two copies of every publication published or produced in Singapore and made available for sale or public distribution is required for deposit in the National Library. So this includes digital publications. It ensures that Singapore's published heritage is preserved, is collected, preserved, and made accessible. Personally, I benefited from this as during my research, I found that there were some books which were only available in our legal deposit collection and not, on the, not in our normal collection. Okay, so what else do I do? I also do web archiving. Web archiving is a bit different from legal deposit because we take a snapshot of the website instead of the publishers depositing materials. Unlike traditional print publications, websites can be changed at any moment. They're very dynamic and ephemeral. And as we take snapshots over a period of time, we will have a record of how the website changes and updates. Yeah. So the content that we archive will be preserved in Web Archive Singapore for future researchers. For example, maybe you guys have heard of this website called SFOX. It stands for Singapore's Freakiest Online Ghost Stories. Yeah, maybe one day this will be in our Web Archive collection as well. So just to share more about me, I actually grew up in a time when there was a lot of horror fiction being published in Singapore and they were all lining the shelves of bookstores like popular, yeah, you see the whole shelf full of them. Yeah, so I think that is part of why I like horror so much today. So I thought that I would share with you like my first encounters with Singapore horror. Yes, so this is my first encounters. Do I see some people nodding their heads? Yeah, so I was drawn to this book called Nightmares because it featured like a thematic collection of horror stories. So they will give you themes like Malay ghosts, hospitals, cemeteries, taxi driver nightmares. So I felt like I could choose my own horror setting in a way. Yeah, so I remember that I chose this book on hospitals specifically because my mom is a nurse and I attended childcare at a hospital at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I also grew up, I grew up and stayed up late watching Incredible Tales of Mediacorp. Um, to be honest, I'm probably not the target audience for this, and I think I was a bit young, but I really enjoyed it because uh, it felt a bit like I was doing something that I'm not supposed to do. So I'm learning about this whole new world that my parents don't tell me about usually. Okay, so now I want to share the, uh, some statistics on who reads horror fiction in Singapore. So the NLB uh, conducts a national reading habit study every two years to track the leisure reading habits of Singapore residents. And these uh, survey results are actually available online if you search for them. 
So in the, in the survey, they separated the participants into two groups, teenagers from age 13 to 19 and adults, uh, everyone above the age of 20. For the fiction readers, they ask them, uh, what genres do you read? So if they read, uh, let's say, horror or comedy, they, that would be a point in their favor. So uh, on the statistics board, you can see that, let me get this, yeah, so the percentage indicates that for this age group, let's say 13 to 16, 43% uh, of the fiction readers say that they read this genre, this horror genre. Yeah, so um, we can see that horror is actually most popular with teenagers, the age of 13 to 19. It's the most popular with them, but it's actually not their most read genre. Their most read genres are actually things like humor and romance, which is honestly not surprising. Yeah. In general, honor, uh, horror becomes less popular the older readers get. You can see a general downward trend uh, across the age groups. Yeah. So for women, for the green bars, their interest in horror uh, decreases at 17 years old quite sharply. Uh, and when they are 13 to 16, about half of them do read horror, but it decreases very sharply at this age. And after that, it, it stays the same when they're 20 to 29, and then decreases when they're 30. Yeah. So for men, it's about the same when they're teenagers, and then decreases when they reach age 20. So throughout their teenage years, they're still quite interested. And you might be thinking, why does interest in horror decrease as people get older? Uh, it might be due to another trend that they found in the survey, which is that as people grow older, they also read less fiction in general. And because uh, they soon read a lot more non-fiction than fiction, and since horror was not their top genre in the first place, it tends to get dropped in favor of others. Yeah. Okay. Why is Singapore horror significant? It can be seen as an assertion of narrative in our post-independence period. It's also very multicultural and taps on the rich folklore that we have. There is a lot of different people uh, who come together to make, to create horror fiction or produce horror films. And it also reflects our society's fears and anxieties, such as tradition versus modernity, social alienation, etc. And we'll see this later when I share some of the stories that I found. Okay, so just to preface, for my research, in this, or on this talk, um, I actually started with this article written in Below Asia by Eng Yisheng. It's called A History of Singapore Horror, and I encourage those who haven't seen it to go and read it because it gives you a very uh, good outline of the history of Singapore horror. And I actually use this article as a jumping off point for my research as well. And also for the, uh, the book's timeline that I will share later, I kind of followed, uh, followed what he laid out in the timeline as well. So this is what we're going to talk about for books. Uh, we're going to go to the pre-1950s. I'll share uh, the folklore that was believed at the time. And then we'll talk about horror fiction being published in newspapers. And then we'll go to the 1990s, where there were a lot of horror fiction anthologies published. And then 2000s and beyond. And you see what has been published like, around this time. So we'll go straight into folklore and supernatural beliefs. There is this book called Malay Magic, an introduction to the folklore and popular religion of the Malay Peninsula. It's written by Walter Skid, and we have this in our collection. It's, it's also been digitized. It's available on BookSG. Yeah, so Walter Skid is an English anthropologist who studied both the urbanized Malays living near the coast as well as Aboriginal tribes living inland who were beyond European influence. Um, he talked about their beliefs and their religion. So I picked out some things that I thought would be interesting for this talk. One of them is that he talks about the Pawang or the Bomo, who is an intermediary between men and spirits. And they were considered part of the order of society, without which a village would not be considered complete. They are also known as medicine men or village sorcerer. Now, it's actually quite hard to find photos of Bomos online because when you search Bomo, you actually get the Malaysian, the Malaysian Bomo with the coconuts, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I had to look into our archives online, which is actually our National Archives collection. So I found this picture of the Bomo. Uh, it's a Bomo at Changi uh, doing his thing. Yeah. By the way, this book is published in 1900. Okay. So next, he also talks about hantus. So hantus is a general term for evil spirits. And I'll go through um, a, a few of them. So one of them is the Harimau Jadian. 
which is were tigers. These are people who, driven by bloodlust, can turn into tigers and become man-eaters. The power to turn into a tiger is supposed to be confined to one tribe of Sum Sumatrans called the Korinchi Malays, who can turn into tigers at will. And it is said that you can spot one by looking at their upper lip, where they have no furrow, supposedly. And there are stories of Korinchis vomiting chicken feathers after having eaten chickens in their tiger form. Walter Skeet also recounted hearing a tale about a man who had gold platings in his teeth, and when he was killed in his tiger form, they found the same gold platings in the tiger's teeth. Okay, next we'll go to the more famous, famous periods called the Lang Sui and the Pontianak. So Walter Skeet also told, uh, wrote about what these uh, hantus were. So if a woman dies during childbirth, she becomes a Lang Sui, which is a flying demon which can also take the form of a night owl. If her child is stillborn, it becomes a Pontianak. The Lang Sui wears robes of green, has long tapering nails, which is a mark of beauty, and, long hair, and has long black hair down to her ankles. Note the long nails in this figure. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Okay, so the long hair that she has is meant to hide the hole at the back of her neck, through which she sucks the blood of infants. However, these vampiric tendencies may be suppressed if you cut off her hair and nails and stuff it into the hole in her neck. It is said that she will then become tame and indistinguishable from an ordinary woman and can remain so for years. And Walter Skeet writes that there have been cases where he has heard that a Lang Sui has become a wife and even a mother. So he writes that the Pontianat takes a form similar to its mother as a night owl. And there isn't much else written on the Pontiana in Malay magic other than what I've told you. However, in a newspaper article in 1912, there is a reader who discussed Malay magic. And particularly, he was confused over the difference between the Pontiana and the Lan Sui. Because as we know it today, the Pontiana is actually like, has the characteristics of the Lan Sui that I've just described, right? Okay, so I changed this. Now, the Pontiana is no longer known as a stillborn child. And some people believe that the difference between the Lang Sui and the Pontiana is the placement of the hole in their body. So the Lang Sui is supposed to have a hole in the top of her head instead of the back of her neck, like the Pontiana. And also, she likes fish. So she hangs out near the fishing, the docks where the fishermen come in. Yeah. Yeah. So now, um, I'll go on to the next one the Penanggalan. So both the Penanggalan and the Lang Sui are described as vampires who suck the blood of children. And Walter Skid tells this origin story of how a woman became a Penanggalan. And it's pretty funny. There was a woman sitting in a wooden vat of vinegar performing a religious penance when a man came in and asked, what are you doing here? And the woman replies, it's none of your business. But she's also so startled that in her haste to stand up, she accidentally kicks her chin with such force that the skin around her neck split and her head and entrails became separated from her body and she flew off to perch on the nearest tree. Yeah, so that's his story of how she became a Penanggalan. But there are other versions which are that she is also a woman who died in childbirth or that she was a woman who practiced the occult arts and was in the service of a devil until the period of her service ended and she was gifted the power to fly. So it is said that whoever she sucks blood from will die. And if the blood and water from her intestines drip on anyone, they will have a serious illness. The Penanggalan is also said to fear thorns and sharp objects, as her entrails may be caught in them. It is said that her entrails enlarge when she flies around, and to shrink them, she has to immerse in vinegar in order to feed them back into her body. So in the foreword, Walter Skid wrote about how he was accused of writing about nonsensical fancies and beliefs. And there were people questioning why he wrote this book. Why not write about facts? And he replied, now for facts, we all, of course, have the greatest respect. But the objection appears to me to involve an unwarrantable restriction of the meaning of the word fact, a belief which is actually held. Even a mere fancy that is entertained in the mind has a real existence and its effect just as much as any other. Do you agree? <laughs> yes. So he meant that 
it's very real to the people at the time, and that's how they live their lives around these beliefs. So therefore, this is worthy to be written down and studied. Okay, so we move on to the next part. Uh, there were also horror stories and encounters with the supernatural reported and published in the newspaper. So the next part is a newspaper article, but it's not a horror fiction. It is The Riddle of Singapore's Haunted Lane. So this was published in the Straits Times uh, in 1933. It was reported like a real story. Okay, it says, The Riddle of Singapore's Haunted Lane, Invisible Hand That Struck Down European. Beautiful girl in a tree. I wonder who? Uh, men lifted off their feet. And the reason why I put the numbers is because it says three uncanny stories, but it wasn't very clear which stories they were talking about. Yeah. So what is the mystery of Thompson Road, Singapore? Within the past few days, in a dark lane adjoining that road, an invisible something has, number one, attacked a European and left him unconscious in a drain to recover with dry sea sand in his ears, nose and mouth. And number two, struck another man, lifted him off his feet in a complete somersault and flung him to the ground unconscious. And number three, a woman eyewitness declared that she saw in the lane the bust of a beautiful girl amid the leaves of a banana tree. One theory to account for these uncanny experiences is that the thing which attacked the two men was a Pontianak, a Malay spirit similar to a vampire, which appears in the form of a beautiful woman with a need, with a lust for blood. And then the European who is telling this story then says, I have lived in Singapore for more than 15 years, and I used to think a Pontianak was all piffle and bosh, but now I believe there is something in the native superstitions. What beats me is how my friend, who is more than 13 stone, could be very easily flung into the ditch. There is my story, you can believe it or not. I thought it was quite interesting that this made the newspapers, and there was even a follow-up article saying how the spirit has not yet been caught. <laughs> the journalists also went to investigate the scene. So other than this real account that I found, there were also horror fiction published in newspapers. And these are two stories that I found. First one, Jungle Nights, The Slaying of the Penangalan, published in the Singapore Free Press and Mer Mercantile Advertiser in 1912, and later on, The Girl in the Moonlight in 1950. And this is an illustration from The Girl in the Moonlight. So in the first story, the story begins with a storyteller called Ali. He's telling stories to a group of Malay people, and he tells a story about how his friend accidentally married a Penanggalan. <laughs> And this is the story of how he basically killed her. Soon I heard a rustling, and then she came forth. A truly fearsome sight. Her head, alone with her glorious hair, and her bloody entrails, trailing from the neck, floated through the air towards the house of Hassan. Next story, published in 1950. This story is a married couple telling the story of how they met. This one is a bit interesting because it's about this man. He hears someone singing, and he looks over the wall and sees this beautiful girl. And then he realized she was floating, floating off the ground. And then he said, it seemed an injustice that so lovely a being should have the lived life of a Pontianak, because he assumes that she is a Pontianak. It was no life at all, from the stories he remembered for a young girl with an so entrancing a voice and figure. She had turned back from the banana trees and was floating very slowly towards him. The moonlight lit up her face, and it seemed more beautiful than ever. So can you guess what he decides to do? <laughs> yeah, he decides that he needs to marry this girl. <laughs> and he's thinking, hmm, if I just stick something in her neck, she'll become a human, right? Or like a human, and then I can marry her. Yeah, so that's what he does. He takes a nail, he jumps over the wall, he rushes towards her, and of course, she sees him and screams, and she falls off her tightrope. So what happened is, she's a tightrope walker, and that's why she was floating off the ground. Yeah, so this story plays with your beliefs or your uh, assumptions of who she is and how to make her human. Okay. Then we will jump ahead to the 1950s now. Okay. So Offman Walk, you might know him as a Singapore politician. He's the ex-minister of social affairs. So before he was a politician, he had a career in journalism. And he wrote for the Utusan Melayu. 
He says, ghosts, horror, and the supernatural. That is all part of our Malay culture. Malays just love stories like these. And Yusuf Ishak, who is the founder of Utusan Melayu, asked me to write one every week for the Sunday edition called Utusan Zaman. Sure enough, the circulation almost tripled. So he wrote these stories in Jawi, and they were also published in Mastika, a publication by Utusan Melayu. And luckily for us, because I'm sure most of us can't read Jawi, they were actually translated to English and published in this series called Malayan Horror. So Offman Walk's daughter, Lee Offman, she always wanted to read her father's stories, but they were in Jawi. So she decided to get them translated to English just to read them. And then she realized they were actually quite good. So she published them in three collections and shared them with the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah. So there are three collections. It's called Malayan Horror. Uh, unseen Occupants and the Disused Well. I have two of them on the table here, so you can take a look later if you want. Yeah, so in the foreword for Malayan Horror, she writes that these stories have a nostalgic appeal for those who lived in British Malaya and Singapore. And for young readers, they are mere insights into the supernatural beliefs and maybe experiences of our forefathers. For others, this book is simply entertaining. And I like this forward because I feel like it sums up the three reasons why we want to read horror stories, right? Like nostalgic appeal for our, maybe the stories we read in our childhood or we heard in our childhood. For young readers, we can learn about the supernatural beliefs of our forefathers. And then for others, it's just fun to read. Yeah, so a review on this book, Malayan Horror, said that the stories contain elements of modern life involved in supernatural encounters. This was... Um, Malayan horror in the 50s, and it normalized the Malay professional in different scenarios to show how they have truly embraced modernity, but have not left their folkloric elements which symbolize their heritage behind. And it's also a new narrative of the independ newly independent Malaya in Singapore. Now, for example, there's a story of a clerk in a legal firm who moves into a modern concrete house. Uh, one modern concrete house in the neighborhood of traditional wooden Malay houses. And he actually uses the word traditional wooden Malay houses. And the clerk is soon disturbed by knocking, which comes from inside the walls of his house. Yeah, for the full story, you have to read the book. There is another story about a professional Malay photographer with a photo studio in a row of shop houses. And he helps this strange Chinese man take a portrait shot in his studio, whom he later realizes is a ghost. Okay, so next we have the time in between 1956 and our next section. Yeah, so what was published in between? This is not all the books, but generally there were quite few books only. Yeah, so in 1957, we have this Jawi book called Puaka. It's published by Gallagher Press. And Puaka means spirit or ghost. So this book was originally written by a captain from the British Army and translated into Malay by Abu bin Adam. And each chapter contains stories and accounts of Malayans with spirits. Next, in 1979, so quite a big jump, we have The Pontianak by Ho Achuan. This book looked quite promising to me due to the cover and the title. However, it is not actually a horror book. It only uses horror tropes within a larger mystery, like a Sherlock Holmes mystery. So it's kind of like the girl in the moonlight story. Yeah. It has a very nice cover, but yeah, it's not horrible. But it's also on the, on the, on the table if you want to look at it. Okay. In 1983, we have our first English language collection of horror stories. It's written by Catherine Lim, who is known for her Singapore short stories. In it, she writes about not so much supernatural creatures, but of rites and rituals in everyday settings and also how entrenched beliefs can play out in some cruel ways. For example, in the story called Two Male Children, a baby boy named Golden Dragon is born to a rich family. And at the same time, a boy called Piglet is born to a poor family. When Golden Dragon falls ill, his family consults a temple medium who goes into a trance and tells them that Golden Dragon has been chosen to be a male attendant to the dark deity. So the temple medium adds that the dark deity is also considering another infant boy born at the same time. So he's basically playing two, two infant boys against each other, saying that one cannot live while the other survives. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, so the rich family happens to be an employer of Piglet's mother. So 
what they do is they use their authority over her and use their wealth to basically guilt trip her into skewing the advantage to her child. And it's quite sad, the story. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the last one is called The Ghost Lover of Emerald Hill. And it's written by another well-known literary writer, Go Sintab. And the story was apparently inspired by a legend of a true ghost in Emerald Hill. And Go Sintab also grew up in Emerald Hill. So, could be true. Okay, so now we come to the very exciting period in horror fiction. We have true Singapore ghost stories. Yeah, I'm trying to be dramatic. Okay, so anyway, the, uh, the almost complete collection of true Singapore ghost stories was published by Russell Lee and his team of ghost writers. Volume 1 featured 50 ghost tales from interviews conducted over three years. Now, the book literally redefined what it means to be a bestseller in Singapore. It debuted at the 21st Singapore International Festival of Books and Book Fair, and it sold out all 6,000 copies, and it immediately went into its next print run, and sold another 20,000 to 30,000 copies over the next two months, and then it continued for 25 volumes. On the 25th anniversary of the publication, they collated all their favourite stories over the years into one book. And by the time the 16th volume was published in 2007, it had sold over 850,000 copies. It says that it features hair-raising stories told by real people, and this really struck a chord with Singaporeans. The author Russell Lee would sit at a cafe and invite people to come to the cafe and tell him stories. And each story in the book also states the occupation and age of the teller. And one of the reviewers for the first volume of True Singapore Ghost Stories said, one of the pleasures of reading the book is waiting to feel that freak out bump, that small moment of collision. Local ghosts are more scary because geographical familiarity bleeds, breeds, even in the most intrepid, at least a half belief. So it goes back to the suspension or disbelief of the willingness to believe that the stories that are being told are real and can actually happen. And when it happens in like a HDB, it makes them more believable and more interesting because it fits, it features people from all walks of life in familiar environments that we all know. Yes, so following the success of True Singapore Ghost Stories, other authors and publishers were also quick to feed the public's appetite for local supernatural tales. They realised there was a demand, and so they fed it. By the late 1980s, countless volumes of ghost stories were flying off the presses, including all these stories. And this is from um, A History of Singapore Horror in Biblio Asia. So what do these anthologies have in common? They claim to be true tales or eyewitness accounts. In the foreword, they usually say, we source this from real people who actually experience these things. They ask the readers to keep an open mind. They say, this is my story, believe it or not. And they tend to be book series because then they can publish a lot, and there are many reprints. So they tend to be reprinted, maybe like one each year. And they also have a reputation as pulp fiction. What is pulp fiction? Pulp fiction is a term which originated in the 1930s and refers to escapist fiction printed on cheap wood pulp paper. In addition, the pulp magazines were very popular because they often featured lurid covers with pretty women in various states of undress or trouble. Yeah, so at the, at the time in Singapore, uh, these books were considered pulp fiction. It might be because that, inspired by the success of True Singapore Ghost Stories, many indie first-time publishers were taking on multiple roles, like handling marketing by themselves. And in the rush to get the books printed due to the amount of competition, they may have neglected editorial details and formatting like page numbers and margins. But... <laughs> The good thing was, there was also a sense of optimism and gung ho about the book publishing business at the time. We saw a lot of entrepreneurs trying to carve their own niche in the public publishing industry. So other popular book series include Classic Singapore Horror Stories by Damien Sin, The Nightmare Series, which I talked about, published by Pugalenti SR, and the Mr. Midnight Series by James Lee, known as Asia's Answer to Harry Potter, due to the book sales matching the number of Harry Potter books sold in Singapore. And then we have the Soul series by Ramesh Kula and Chan Man Loon. Uh, Soul series is actually illustrated, and it's also on the table. <laughs> okay, 
So what kind of themes do these stories have? Popular themes include army horror, suicide, encounters with creatures from folklore, karmic retribution or revenge, and greed and its consequences. Two examples of stories that are often featured, how to get the winning numbers for lottery. <laughs> so apparently there's a few ways. You can go to a graveyard and ask the spirits for winning numbers by sticking a tube into a grave and a voice will whisper the numbers to you. Or you can tie a ribbon from your bed to a banana butt and the spirit will slither up to you. But of course there's a price for such generosity. Another story, cab drivers driving alone at night on a long stretch of road. They see a woman and pick her up and she asks them to take, them, take, to take her home to a cemetery. And after that, she pays them with hell notes. Yeah, so these are the kind of stories that uh, were proliferated at the time. And the creator of the Soul series said that eventually they had to stop publishing because it was just getting ridiculous as everyone was doing ghost stories and there were no new ones on the market. So we see that um, near the end of the 1990s, the volume of ghost stories anthologies kind of died off. And then we come to the 2000s and beyond, where we have uh, more variations, even though there were less fiction published. So I'll just go through this quickly. We have a graphic novel, a spooky writing course by NLB, a zombie apocalypse in Singapore, and we have an agony for haunted people. So if you are being haunted, you can write in, and a team of Ghostbusters and Exorcists will respond. <laughs> okay, next we have Asian Spine Chillers, which is actually an augmented reality children's book. So you can actually scan the page and see some AR stories. We have a Gertai Singer's Love Affair with a Ghost. Yeah, very good for Hungry Ghostmen. And we also have Bittersweets, which is a 21st century Buddhist hell social media horror. <laughs> yes, so there's also the rise of speculative fiction which encompasses elements of supernatural, horror, science fiction, fantasy, etc. And the annual Singapore Writers' Festival has also organized panels and screenings related to horror each year to continue fascination. Okay, so now we go to the films. I divided them into three. The 1950s to 60s are Golden Age, where we see the Pontianak and Orang Minyak films. 1990s are called The Revival, where we see Mipok Man, true crime films. 2000s and beyond, we have horror comedy and homage. So the Golden Age was an era of prolific film production in Singapore with two studios, Cathay Carey's and Shaw's Malay Film Productions. By the early 1960s, their combined output of films was about 18 to 24 per year. And by the time it closed in 1967, Malay Film Productions had produced about 160 movies. So this was a very creative and fertile period for films made in Singapore, thus considered the Golden Age of Malay cinema in Singapore. Now, although the stars of the film were Malay, the movies were financed by Chinese businessmen. The directors were mostly Indian, some born in Singapore and some brought to Singapore from India due to a lack of local talent. Two Indian directors, B. N. Rao and L. Krishnan, had a hand in creating two of the iconic creatures in Golden Age films, the Pontianak and the Orang Minyak. Indian directors also influenced a number of breakthroughs in the film industry such as the use of music and dance in Malay films, which I use to provide a break for the audience from the scares and the tension. So these are some of the films that were produced. Pontianak, the first of the Pontianak films. So there are two trilogies of Pontianak, each produced by one studio. We have Sumpa Orang Minyak, and then we have Sitora Harimau Jadian. So I'll talk more about these soon. Yeah. So, this is an exhibition by, on Singapore films organized by NLB, and it was written that horror's huge popularity in this time might have shocked itself as audiences lapped up movie after movie filled with vampires, ghosts, witchcraft, and other assorted collections of ghosts and goblins. Cathay Carey's films was responsible for churning out most of the ghastly popular horror, ghost, eh, ghastly popular horror movies, while Maria Manado, the popular Pontiana actress, was the face of the genre in more ways than one. This is her from Sumpa Pontiana. So Maria Menado, the popular Pontiana actress, was the face of the genre. She was also known as the Kabaya Queen and as the most beautiful woman in Malaya at the time, making her ghastly role as the Pontiana even more impactful. The realistic makeup in Pontiana was commended, although it restricted her facial movements. So this is from uh, Sumpa Pontiana. 
we see that they have special effects. They use trick photography for special effects. They use a uh, humor unique to this horror series, such as slapstick comedy. This guy, he's stuck in a barrel and he's trying to get out. And this scene is completely pointless to the movie. It has no plot point at all, but it's just put in there. I wanted to add, uh, unfortunately, the, the first two films of the Pontianak series by Cathay Carries are actually lost because um, the films were thrown away in frustration by the co-owner of Cathay Carries. But we do have Suba Pontianak in our collection if you want to watch it. So the making of Pontianak, it was actually a stage play before it was a film, and Maria Manado played the lead actress. This is a newspaper article from that time. It's called Enter Vampire, Exit Girl in an Ambulance. Very dramatic. Apparently an audience member screamed and went into shock as Maria Menado transformed into a Pontianak on stage. And then later on, two years later, this uh, journalist wrote, a point worth noting is that on every occasion, two women audience fainted during the performance. Hmm. So the making of Pontianak, when they announced that the films would be made, they said that um, there is a lot of interest in making a Pontianak film due to the popularity of the place and that research had been done on the widespread stories and beliefs in the country. So the producer-director, B.N. Rao, actually said that he felt sure the film would be a success due to the strong belief among the public that the creature exists. He said that many Malay girls still went around with a lucky charm, a nail stuck in their hair, in case they ever meet a Pontianak. Yeah, so now we go on to Sumpa Orang Minyak. So P. Ramli directed this and also starred in it. The figure of the Orang Minyak was based on happenings in Malaya at the time, where men covered in oil would rape young women around several towns in Malaysia. In the movie, he is covered in dripping black oil to make it harder for the police to catch him. He terrorizes kampongs and embarks on a trail of murder and molestation. So it is said that two to three gallons of oil were used each day for makeup, and it would take the actor like two hours in the bath to get rid of it. So the story of this Sumpa Ora Minyak is that a fairy turns a hunchback into a handsome young man, then evil ones turn him into an oily man. And I'm not sure why. <laughs> so this movie is really cool. It's Sitora Hami Harimau Jadian, Sitora the Were Tiger. This is actually the only lost film of P. Ramley's 34 movies which he directed. So out of the 34, we have 33, but one of them is lost. And it was about the irreconcilable differences between superstition and medical science. So we thought this movie was lost, right? But then someone found this novelization, which was actually printed in 1965, one year after the movie came out. So when this researcher found this book, he thought that he should reprint it. So we have this version in 2012, which includes stills from the movie, and is really the only way that you get to watch it today. Okay, so Pont Pontianak films and also the Golden Age films have this enduring popularity. Even in 1978, there were readers writing into the newspaper to say, can you please show these films? And this one is from 1984. So between the 1960s and the 1990s, there's a very big slowdown in film production. The reason is because the production houses in Singapore basically closed down or moved to Malaysia. The 1970s produced less than 10 feature films, which was a very steep drop in production. So 1990s, the revival, because it's the resurrection of Singapore cinema, started with two horror films, Medium Rare in 1991 and Mipok Man in 1995. Now, Medium Rare is based on the Adrian Lim ritual murders of two children, which shocked the nation in 1981, followed by the murder trial in 1983. And the same case inspired the film God or Dog. Unfortunately, these two films, um, Medium Rare and God or Dog, did not get very good reviews. However, Mi Pok Man was quite a success. It traveled to more than 30 film festivals. It's directed by Eric Koo, and it's about a Mi Pok seller who falls in love with a prostitute called Bunny. The script for Mipok Man was written by horror writer Damien Sin, author of classic Singapore horror stories. And it was based on one of his short stories called One Last Cold Kiss. So Alan, Alan Wee, the artistic director of Substation, said this of the movie, the alienation feels real. It really speaks to me. Singapore is the kind of place where if you don't fit in, even the day-to-day -day can be an existential struggle. 
So Damien's story, Damien's scene stories over, often included social commentary, and this film definitely reflected that. Okay, so now we're at the 2000s and beyond. We have the rise of horror comedy with Where Got Ghost, Zombie Pura, When Ghosts Meet Zombie. Now you might be wondering why do these two genres go together? It's because they have a lot in common. Comedy is about exaggeration and absurdity, and horror is about being excessive. Both share a willingness to go over the top. And these films are quite popular. Now we have the serious horror film called The Maid, produced in 2005 by Kelvin Tong. So this film broke the bro box office record in Singapore for the horror genre making $700,000 on its opening weekend. The premise is that a maid arrives in Singapore during the Hungry Ghost Festival and works for a family in Toji Opera. So she doesn't know about the customs and rituals of the Hungry Ghost Festival and she learns them the hard way. So for example, she goes to a Gertai show and she sits in the front row and then she realizes the people around her are actually... yeah. So Kelvin Tong, he did an interview about this film and he's actually a Buddhist and he's somewhat superstitious on set. So he said on set he would light joysticks on set and explain to the ghost that actually everything is fake. Yeah, and also now we have homage to the Pontianak films. The Return to Pontianak in 2001, which also did well at the box office. And most recently, Revenge of the Pontianak, which is coming out in two days. So this is a homage to the Pontianak films, whose reruns director Glenn Gui watched as a kid in the 70s. And in this story, he wants to humanize the Pontianak by telling the story from her perspective. Yeah, so this is, that's the end of the film history. Now I want to look a bit at the horror events that we also have in Singapore. We have the Scream Asia Film Festival, which is yeah, our first horror film festival, Halloween Horror Nights, Night at the Library, which is happening in October, and State of Motion, which is organized by the Asian Film Archive. So this year it was on horror films. I don't know if you guys caught it. So to conclude, uh, horror stories will likely be around for a long time in different mediums, maybe AR or VR, and the hantus may evolve depending on each generation. And NLB has a lot of resources for content and context, but there is not much analysis like journal articles and books on Singapore horror. Um, for books on Asian horror, they tend to focus on Japan and Korea. So these are the resources that I use. Um, if you're interested, you can come and ask me what they are. And this is some of the research topics that I thought would be cool, such as how figures such as the Pontianak have evolved over time, and now she is being reclaimed as a feminist figure by contemporary artists. And also maybe the intersections between folklore and cinema, and film as vernacular culture. And also factors which led to the boom in horror fiction in Singapore in the 1990s, or the popularity of horror comedy in Singapore today. So whether it's for you know, the freak out bum or for research, I hope that you can come down to the National Library and look at our collections. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Wow, um, what do you think of the presentation? Great, okay, good. <laughs> So let's open the floor for Q&A. Anyone has any question for Jacqueline or comments? No? Okay. I just a uh, comment um, and to share what I think is a very interesting story. Uh, a friend of mine, Tim White, used to teach, used to lecture at um, NUS. Uh, I think he was teaching film. And he, he actually did some research and he found something really interesting about Pontianaks. Mm. He found that um, before the 1960s Pontianaks films came out, uh, if you went around the region and you talked to any Malay um, in Indonesia, Malaysia, they will tell you that a Pontianak is a beautiful woman dressed in green. Yes. That's right. That's what Walter Skid. That's what Walter Skid wrote in his ah. in his book as well. The Lang Sui is a woman who dresses in green green robes. Yeah. yeah. But when the films came out, because they could only film it in black and white, oh. so they decided that they had to make the costume white. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And after that, if you travel around the region and you talk to any Malay, they will tell you that a Pontianak is a woman dressed in white. Yeah. So I thought I, th I found that really interesting. Yeah, that's a good that's a good fact. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sorry, uh, can I ask a question? Is there an, any more modern writers apart from this 
uh, right. Uh, I mean, this golden mm. era of books. Uh, I mean, I grew up with uh, through ghost, uh, through Singapore ghost story. I lost my copy, the first one. Uh. Wow, oh, now it's a collector's <laughs> item. <laughs> Well, I think that one, if I sell on eBay, it can be sell very high price. Yeah. It doesn't have the digit one over there. But uh, is there any more new, uh, new writers coming out um, writing? Uh, yes, actually on this table, there's one book called Bitter Sweets. Okay. Okay, this one, uh, so you guys are saying that the context is like quite old, right? But actually this one, it talks about Buddhist hell, but with a new context of like social media, using technology, cyberbullying, things like that. So things that right now that we are concerned with, this is the probably the most like modern contemporary one that I found, yeah, but I'm sure there's there's always you know people writing horror, people interested in reading it. So definitely there will be new new stuff coming out. So did the horror does it evolve from like say those kampong days? We really have don't have much idea of how the world works. And then mm. banana leaves and a beautiful woman. Then slowly it turned to a very into a psychological horror. Is it something? Is it turning into this type of trend, or is it the folklore Pontiac Mart is like like a relic of the past already? Or something like that? I don't think it's a relic of the past. As we can see, right, there, there will always be folklore, like Pontianak, the new film is just coming out. So I feel like, yes, we, we have these creatures and we will do different things with them. You know, like they will evolve depending on what we fear and what we're anxious about. So I, I really think that the Pontianak and, and other horror figures will, will stay around uh, for very long. But they might look different. Like the gentleman shared, they might not be wearing green robes anymore, they'll be wearing white robes, that kind of thing. So it's like all this uh, horror culture, like the fiction, the films, they influence how people learn about these things. And then in turn, the people who learn about it will also create their own. Hey, we take the question from the lady on the left first. Since you, uh, <clears throat> since you have been working with horror fiction, right? I want to know, number one, do you believe in the hantus, our local hantus? And number two, have you met one in real life? Oh, okay. Um, I will answer your second question first. No, I have not met one, but who knows, right? And to your first question, um, whether I believe, uh, I want to believe, so I'm always on the lookout. But so far, so far, like, I haven't seen anything that I know of. But um, so, because I watch so many horror films, I feel like, like things scare me that don't scare other people. So when I see a long, dark corridor, I immediately think, oh no, there's something there. Whereas my friends who don't watch horror, they're just like, oh, it's just a corridor. Yeah. Probably I'll take one more, one last question. Hi, um, thank you no. for the talk. Sorry. No. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, so, for context, I'm Malaysian, and the uh, Russell Lee books were pretty much my first introduction to Singapore. So, mm. as a kid, reading them, I was thinking there's this island just full of ghosts <laughs> out there, and like, what's, why do people still live there, you know? But uh, they were enjoyable to read. Um, and I just wanted to touch on a point that you made about the gradual decline of horror in both literature and films. Uh, from a Malaysian context, that's certainly true as well, but I think a lot of that has to do with the increasing religious focus in the Malaysian society. So I'm not sure whether that's the same cause here in Singapore. So maybe I was just interested in hearing why you think there were the reasons for decline in this society here. For the, for the horror films in Singapore, it's mostly because the production houses uh, either closed down or went to Malaysia. So because of that, like, at, back then we didn't have uh, iPhones and digital cameras, so we couldn't just shoot a film when we wanted to. So that was the reason why the horror films would stop being produced. And as well, for the horror fiction, I think um, the books in the 1990s, so after True Singapore Ghost Stories came out, they were kind of riding on this wave of like, there's so much demand for this kind of book, so we're just going to churn them out and um, feed the appetite of Singaporeans. And maybe, you know, after you eat a lot of something, you get sick of it, right? So maybe they realized that, um, um, that there's too much and the demand was dropping. And also like the souls uh, creator said that there was this ridiculous how many stories were going around. And also maybe they were just the same stories. Uh, being uh, echoed by all the anthologies. Yeah. So that's why now I pointed out that uh, in the 2000s and beyond, we do see a bit more variation. We have like zombies now. Yeah. 
All right, thank you very much, Jacqueline.